Okay, my name is Professor Wunderlich. I'm an Associate Professor of Engineering and Computer Science. <clears throat> Uh, head of any computer engineering activities, as well as architectural activities, and uh, founded all the robotics and machine intelligence still and involved with a lot of that. I've been here 23 years at Elizabethtown College. I was a professor at Purdue before that, uh, IBM Research before that, uh, AI DuPont Children's Hospital, medical assistive robotics before that, and a bunch of other stuff before that, including building high tech office parks in west and south share screen okay so this is the course we're in uh, students use canvas as well as my website also uh, <clears throat> We'll go into the course. Uh, students have assignments that they're working on. This is a topical course, an introductory course, um, not super low level. It's, uh, it's uh, computer architecture and high tech fundamentals. Uh, they had a reading assignment on intro uh, <clears throat> computer fundamentals. And uh, now the next assignment due next week is for them to pick a high-tech company to both work for and long-term invest in. So we're gonna look at some financial things as well as some tech history. Um, they wanna review and uh, uh, look for a company to pick and uh, look at just not, not only its financial health, but also uh, whether or not they'd like to work there. And the corporate culture, uh, where the locations are, they could wanna work. Um, Financial and product history led you to believe the investment choice was wise. <clears throat> Why your stock made or lost money. So they need to, they'll have a more uh, significant presentation later on. This is just picking their stock for hopefully a good reason by next week. Uh, and then any other criteria they might have. In this course, the uh, main outline is on the syllabus. Loading. Uh, we could also look at it on here on my website. Sometimes loads faster. <clears throat> so um, uh, this is since uh, 1999, uh, 42,000 visitors. And I, I track the activity. Um, people around the world, I can see what they're, what, who's looking at it. Uh, and then there's computing and robotics, uh, architecture and personal things. And this course is in here. Uh, introductory class, computer architecture, high tech fundamentals. Should build a little faster here. It's a little easier display rather than watching it through the Canvas educational database. Um, students are already aware of the syllabus and we're following this outline here of 40 different things and inserting other things, videos and readings as needed. Uh, students should have already by now looked closely through this, which is uh, orders of magnitude and how they impact uh, computing, relevance to computing, both big things and small things, and what we're bumping up against with uh, getting down to angstrom, uh, you know, atomic diameter size now with our minimal feature, minimum feature sizes on chips as well as uh, bumping our heads at the top end, we're trying to go uh, uh, faster and faster with uh, computers and uh, electricity is only a little bit slower than the speed of light. And we're bumping up against that up here on the higher end. So students should understand both, uh, you know, all, all the magnitudes, both big and small, as well as powers of two and 10, 10 and two. So that, <clears throat> that's just part of the foundation fundamentals understanding other things. Uh, chip manufacturing process, we've already looked at, and we looked at some videos, and uh, there's uh, tons of things you can do. Ooh, uh, I had a whole graduate course in that. Don't expect students in here to know that, but be able to sketch out and give a little essay on what they've learned about manufacturing process. Uh, atoms and transistors, uh, starting from the basics 
of atoms, the periodic table, and making the crystalline structure, doping, doping it, how semiconductors work in NMP type semiconductors. And then uh, maybe a little more than everybody in here is comfortable with. Not everybody in here has had any background or not everybody has had background in circuit analysis. Most have not. So really we're just uh, looking at uh, the summary page in this course, what's most important to know in the introductory tech course, the difference between bipolar and uh, uh, CMOS uh, tech technology and how they function. The voltage, and you say, well, who cares about the voltage? Well, <clears throat> uh, if you're doing information systems and, and you're really not designing down to circuit level, but you're buying computer systems and you're putting new chips and boards and uh, you should know these voltages. They'll often be set in the plug and play and the, and the bias now in your computer, but these are things that you can actually change and different chips will run at different voltages. Um, and there's other stuff in there too for advanced courses, uh, digital design things, chip pinouts and other things. Just uh, FYI, I'll just scan over it again real quick here. <clears throat> So other stuff down here is for classes with uh, laboratories. Oh, this is a VLSI chip. Uh, and this is one reason that you wanna know uh, two different voltages because sometimes there'll be bipolar rim or even CMOS running at five volts around the rim. Uh, but you, you need to know what voltage, because you can run CMOS at five volts, but typically the bipolar is at five volts. CMOS would run at like three and a half volts. And you, you would do uh, maybe CMOS in the middle and uh, the bipolar around the rim, because the bipolar can source more current, it can sink higher voltage, absorb spikes. Um, and so you need to know that. And then this is, uh, uh, no matter what your field of computing is, <clears throat> um, this is for mostly people who are gonna do lab projects, typically the engineers and uh, um, often computer science students, sometimes information students, system students. But this is when you actually build with logic, circuits and you need to know the chip pinouts and you have to breadboard things <clears throat> in my other courses. So that's just FYI in there. And then uh, <clears throat> we've had some readings, uh, understand and uh, reading a uh, discussion assignment, understanding Moore's law and that it can't hold up and some little thought experiment just showing there that it just really, you can't just cannot keep doubling uh, anything, you know, in a short period of time, two, every two years or every year and a half, doubling something, it's just gonna become asymptotic at some point. It's just absurd to think about how many transistors you would have on a chip, uh, no matter what you're trying to do. Multiple layers, you know, 3D uh, transistors, so wafer scale things, whatever. And we're already bumping up against atomic diameters, can't get any smaller. So it's just different ways of interpreting uh, doubling the density, <clears throat> but whatever you do, it's not going to keep up. It's just logically flawed to think it's going to last forever. Uh, and then um, uh, a paper about that and then computer history. <clears throat> Very briefly, we looked at a chapter here and uh, we discussed some of the history. Now we're going to look again at some history in a second here, but in a context of uh, financial markets and uh, different companies. And um, so we'll see that in a second. Okay, so that's where we are right now in this course. Is right here, tech history and economics. So I just updated this uh, February 2nd. So this is, uh, I'm recording this now on the uh, 4th, right? I believe, yes, yeah, so February 4th, Friday, February 4th, 2nd uh, was Wednesday of 2022. So um, first thing you wanna consider is um, uh, that th these markets have corrections all the time, but in general, in the United States, it's gone upward. You just have to be patient. If you sell during one of these trenches and buy high and sell low, you're gonna be in trouble. But if you ride it out over years, you should have a several year horizon to think about. And this is not just for your investment, but you want to get to a company that's going to be solvent and uh, with some job security, uh, you might want to think about this. Um, and 
what the world economy is doing to that particular sector of computing. So let me make this a little bit bigger. So um, now I'm not big on memorization, but here's just some things I want you to memorize. And uh, <clears throat> there's only about 10 of them. So a date and a thing. And uh, I used to have a lot more here. I'll talk about some of the other things, but you know, IBM, I'm a former IBMer. So uh, 1914 IBM was created, uh, made typewriters and machine guns during the war. And then some of the first, very first business machines, the very first business machines. Um, <clears throat> I didn't highlight this here. I used to the founder of artificial intelligence and the Turing machine, you know, 1937. And you know, just something uh, if you can outsmart the. There's a Turing test if you can convince uh, yourself that you're talking to a person in another room when it's a computer answering. Then that's a form of artificial or a test for artificial intelligence. A lot of other footnotes here. I, this is all from Wikipedia, and then I added a bunch of stuff and edited it quite a bit from from a couple of decades ago. Uh, the first computer. Now, people argue there's uh, you know, mechanical computers and things like that, but the first real working computer was University of Pennsylvania ENIAC, um, the Moore School there. And it was a military top secret thing for calculating trajectories. We talked about that last time. And so, yes, you should know when the first computer was made, you should know, you know, humor me with IBM, uh, but not so much so. I mean, IBM is, was the leader in computing. Uh, I mean, it leads in certain sectors now, not all computing. But we'll talk about that. The first transistor, this is key in making things tiny. So 1947, Bell Labs. Uh, that's a whole other story there. That there used to be the, the phone company used to be a huge monopoly. And um, um, Bell Labs was the research arm of that. So if you have a monopoly and own all the phone companies across the United States, you can fund some pretty nice research. Now it, it's eventually spun off and became Lucent Technologies, uh, the, the research lab when the Bells were broke, the phone company was broken up into the baby bells, uh, but it never quite again had that thrust of research uh, as back when it was a monopoly. I mean, there's a good and bad to monopolies, you know. Uh, <clears throat> mostly bad, actually, most of the time. Uh, then, you know, different, different than the first transistor. That's the first little tiny thing. I talked about tubes last time. <coughs> if we're in the lab, I have some leftover tubes. Uh, that were my father's actually. Um, I mean, he, he worked in high tech for 25 years in computers, big companies, and he would bring home parts. And I have some tubes in the lab. And each tube you can consider a separate little transistor. And now we can fit 10 billion of them on a chip. Uh, and the tube is you know size of your thumb essentially, even bigger. And so we went really small, and then. That's in discrete components. The transistor was a one, you know, little tiny thing. It became tiny, but then really tiny integrated circuits. And now we have VLSI, very large scale integration, like a chip I showed you on the wall in the lab, a <clears throat> little network chip uh, that I made. And this, so 1959, the first integrated circuit. And that's key because now we're off to the races. You can, you've got the building block of what can become a computer. I just highlighted this for the first time, uh, this recently, because social networking now is so uh, uh, impactful on our lives. It's not just entertainment where it was at first. It's actually tweaking how we do things, how we vote in elections, how we choose what groups we're part of, uh, how we break into factions, unfortunately, at times. And we're gonna look at uh, some other things that go along with that in a minute when AI gets involved. Now the internet, and so this uh, this this was uh, you know 1962. Now this is not the internet as we know it now. There's a DARPA net. It was a military a connection between a bunch of machines for for uh, weapons research out west between the big universities. But the DARPA net did um, did exist. 
Um, I like to put this in here because the first graphic user interface, you take it for granted now, we can watch streaming videos, we have pictures. I grew up in a text mode. I'm 60 years old, so born in 1961. Uh, until 1984 or five, uh, well, so the first apples had some gooeyness to them, but they weren't serious machines that anybody used for anything for a little while, um, uh, even though the very first computer, you know, uh, personal computer came out of uh, the Apple world. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't a good business machine or a useful machine for a while. Uh, 1969, the first internet message in the ARPANET. Uh, 1971, first microprocessor. So we had integrated circuits back here, uh, but we didn't have a microprocessor. So this is a, you know, this is the heart of the computer. This is the microprocessor. There's microcontrollers too that I teach about in other courses, but that's uh, something not so much we get into here. And so. Uh, yeah, so only a couple more things. First IBM, P first PC in 1980, and then 84, the World Wide Web. So there's internet stuff, there was connectivity back here, but it was not easy for anybody to get access to. So um, this researcher in Switzerland just came, you know, Tim Berners-Lee came up with this hypertext transfer protocol, which is the foundation for allowing uh, web pages and uh, web surfing before that, and even a little bit after this, in research labs I worked in the late 80s and early 90s were still just FTPing things to each other. There was no real web serving at all, even though the foundation was there. And then a couple more things here. Um, Microsoft, um, Oh, by the way, uh, if you're worrying about RML, you said there's only 10 things. On the test, I typically ask you to just tell me what decade they were. So if you just know the 90s for the, in the 80s back there, uh, and, but know those things that are highlighted. Uh, Microsoft, and, and somebody brought this up also in class, a very good uh, topic and discussion was, uh, of discussion was standardizing um, <clears throat> things versus not. So, uh, and they said it looked like in the olden days, uh, and it's true that it used to be a lot more freedom of trying new things, not adhering to any person's one standard. Now that this is those times are emerging from those times, but there were, uh, when you have that kind of uh, free thinking, it's in a capitalistic, uh, you know, winner take all kind of thing. Uh, Microsoft was pretty aggressive about not only making the best products, uh, which is argu arguable if they actually did at the time, but actually destroying the competition. And they were found guilty of that. And uh, uh, the, the company was forced to parse into pieces. Actually, the European Union fined them also quite a bit and the United States antitrust uh, uh, courts uh, broke them into two pieces. It didn't actually help uh, <clears throat> because if you have your application developers and your system developers in two co different companies, well, the system developers is going to share the APIs with the, the, the sister company, even if they're completely separate financially, before they share it with other software developers. And that's what actually would happen. Uh, Google, I just highlighted this for the first time here. So uh, in the 90s, we now have this powerful search engine. And Google is more than just a search engine now. It does quite a bit of other things. Uh, then we had in the 2000s a giant collapse of the stock market uh, right after, well, 9-11 had something to do with, but it was more that the companies um, had inflated values, inflated uh, price to earnings ratios, we'll talk about in a second, where the price, the stock price is not reflective of the actual earnings, you know, the actual financial health of the company. And so typically you want, I mean, it depends on the sector, but you know, 20 is actually a little bit high sometimes. We, the price divided by earnings. Uh, some people say even you know, 12, 15 when I was in IBM. But you know, people will tolerate software companies up to 50-ish. During the, this dot-com bubble, they were 100 to, 100 to 200 uh, you know, price to earnings ratio, the price, you know, the price 200 times the earnings 
you know, per per share. Uh, that's just pure hype and perception, and then it crashed. And crashed so much. I mean, you want to watch. This is not just a ten percent correction. This is from five thousand to one thousand. So you've lost, you know, eighty percent of the value. That that's bad. A lot of people got caught in that. Now I was pretty diversified and not heavily invested at that time. And then I actually bought a whole bunch down in this valley here. And that was paid off quite a bit over time, you know, after the crash, because it oversold. So, um, and then uh, Apple makes the cell phone. Uh, I give a little story about how Apple almost went out of business. And uh, ironically, the biggest competitor, IBM, bailed out Apple by helping Motorola, who used to provide the processors for Apple, uh, and Apple, uh, the power PC chip, they, uh, IBM developed it to keep Apple alive, to actually keep the markets alive against the Wintel machine, which was by that time a Windows operating system, an Intel processor. It was not really an IBM thing, even though it was called an IBM PC. It was never more than 10% of the revenue of the company, as I explained in a, a story, even during the heyday when I, IBM owned all, essentially all of the working PCs in the world. Uh, it was never more than 10% of the revenue because IBM operates in all the different five different levels, you know, up to supercomputers and large scale enterprise servers for, uh, for the whole world <clears throat> with almost 500,000 people when I worked there. Uh, here, I didn't highlight it here, but here's where Microsoft got fined $1.3 billion for its business practices, um, unfair business practices. And then um, you, this is now coming in the era where you remember most of you were born right around 2000 ish probably 2000 and later, all of you, I believe. Um, so uh, 2008, you're still very young, but this was the last big significant crash. And it really didn't have anything to do with the high tech people causing a problem like the dot com bubble. But this was, uh, uh, poor lending practices for housing. Uh, and I don't want to go on a whole tangent on a story on that, but I had lived through a similar thing with the, uh, the uh, savings and loans in the, in the mid-1980s when I was building high-tech office parks in Texas and California. People would borrow, uh, lenders would lend more than they should, but it was regional. And then so these development projects just crashed and burned and all over the Southwest, but it didn't almost destroy the entire financial market. What happened in 2008 was different. These subprime mortgages given, given to you know, developers in the same locations I had worked, but all over the world. And then what's made it worse is that there's a secondary market where the underwriters write these notes and then the notes are put into portfolios, big giant investment portfolios. Uh, that are you know that are all over the place. I mean, I have some real estate investment trusts and things like right, like that now. And but you know, all of a sudden, all that crashed, and it almost like destroyed all of the finances of the uh, say of the world. But it was it took a seven hundred billion dollar bailout by the government just to save it from becoming an all out catastrophe. And it still crashed the um, the markets and. Put us into a recession that took years to get out of. Now you're saying, okay, um, you were just children like that then, so you don't remember. But now here we're starting to get close to home now. Um, uh, we we oh I didn't I didn't put in here uh, the COVID recession, but it's down below here. Uh, yeah, I just put present day two thousands here. Uh, you almost talk about the COVID recession, or it's not even a recession, it's just what well, it is. It was very short, believe it or not, even though the other impacts non financial are still hitting us. Um, so, 2020s, I have a whole lecture, hour and a half thing just on looking at these things. <clears throat> but I'm uh, AI and robotics, I just put this in here, and I want to touch on these things more now than ever in this course. Uh, and so, you know, in my own assessment of what's good, virtual and augmented reality to help humanity, some medicine, uh, you know, there's lots of things that you can do with AI that's good. And we'll talk about those questionable automated journalism and stock picking. I want to play a little video of that in a second. 
uh, deep fakes, right? Uh, so we don't even know what we're seeing, if it's real or not. Uh, the most recent thing was just a couple of days ago that our intelligence in the United States uncovered that the Russians had a video, a fake video of the Ukrainians actually invading Russia. Uh, and they used that, and they were going to use that as the justification to launch an attack. Um, autonomous cars and planes, you could hear me rant all about that somewhere in other contexts where uh, I personally think that's a very dangerous thing to do. I don't care how many redundant systems and sensors you have. Uh, I still see cases where uh, reasons to have a human in the loop in machines that are everywhere, especially in the air. Neural implants, um, that's something we're we'll talking about in my AI classes. And, uh, and Neuralink and uh, Elon Musk's, Musk's latest adventure. Uh, I love a lot of what he does. Some of it I think is a little risky, some of it's a little bit ridiculous, but for the most part, he's one of the most significant people who's ever lived on the earth. So uh, you need to follow what he's doing, but uh, you know, you gotta watch when you're, when you're trying to interface humans directly with the machine. Yes, that'd be great for uh, people helping them cure people with disabilities you know, help people with aging problems, but uh, you can imagine the corruption that can happen if there's a direct interface interface between all human minds and some collective network that can be hacked into. Uh, social engineering, and that's segues from neural implants, but not, not just neural implants, but the way you can use just Facebook, for example, which by the way, lost 25%, something like that, of its value just yesterday, uh, which is unheard of usually for a stock to crash that much. I own some of that. Luckily, I'm pretty diversified, but uh, that, that was a pretty significant thing. Uh, customer service without people. And we've all suffered that now when you've got to answer, listen to 10 phone prompts you know, before you get anybody or anything, any information. And then robotics, uh, good hazardous waste cleanup, COVID, nuclear, et cetera, tedious tasks, exploration, search and rescue. I have a whole lecture on this. Uh, a questionable autonomous weapons and companions. So it's the same as with autonomous vehicles, and, you know, cars and planes. I feel the same way about weaponry. You have to be real careful before you just let uh, the drones decide uh, on the, you know, who the hostiles are versus acceptable, acceptable collateral damage. <clears throat> And then companions, that can be a great thing, especially with baby boomers here in Japan and other countries where there's just an elderly population and they need you know, somebody just to give them their pills or, I don't know, come in and play some music. But you know, if you start substituting artificial uh, you know, humanoids for real humanoids, uh, that could break down social structures. All right, so I want to come back here and quickly and play something, a little video on uh, automated journalism and stock picking. Uh, and then I just want to go down in these recessions here real quick before I do that, because I left out, I mean, here, here's, well, quickly here, here, just to keep it in context, there's always ups and downs. I mean, these are recessions and depressions over the past couple of hundred years in the United States. The Great Depression, I heard a million stories from my father who grew up in that probably doesn't resonate with any of you because it's just so long ago. It's like ancient history, but that was 10 years. People really lost quite a bit. Um, the story I hear is both my grandfather and his wife got married late and they both had enough money. They, they bought their house with cash and they had enough money in the bank uh, to buy another house with cash. And they were the wealthiest people in the neighborhood. It was just row homes in Philadelphia at the time. It wasn't a big deal, but still, and then the banks, closed. The banks crashed. There was no FDIC. They lost their money. Just imagine if everything you had in the bank suddenly doesn't exist because the bank goes out of business. Now they're insured. And so that day, my grandfather had to go and borrow money uh, from somebody to buy some food for that week, uh, the neighbor. And luckily where he worked at Baldwin and Locomotives went to a four-day week instead of laying people off. So everybody just agreed to work a little less. Uh, and they kept eating locomotives. But anyway, that's a big deal. It's ancient history to all of you. Now here's uh, 
what's important to you. The dot com we already mentioned, the housing bubble we already mentioned, but this COVID recession, perhaps I should put it up, up above there too, but this is you guys. Global pandemic killed, you know, as of this printing of this update, 890,000 Americans caused shutdown of schools and businesses and seriously impacted medical facilities and global supply chain. And we're feeling the global supply chain now. I, I really thought that was gonna happen sooner. Um, and it took several years to fully recover economically and otherwise, right? I mean, the economics, we're not, nobody's really hurting that much. Jobs, well, new jobs are you know, all over the place. People don't actually wanna work. They got used to not working or they're afraid to go out and get sick. Um, but there's an emotional toll here that we're all feeling. Okay, so um, talking for 30 minutes straight here. Let me let me take a little break and play a couple little videos, a couple minutes long each to complement. Here, in two modules. Uh, we get all this silicon stuff here, electrical fundamentals and all that. We're out of that part. Now we're in here. So these two here, I've got to publish them now. Uh, there's a three minute one and a four minute one. And this would be, uh, you have a semester project in here and I give you a lot of freedom to do all kinds of things. You could write software, you could build something if you know how to, I can't promise to give you parts in this level of a class, but uh, mostly it's a research thing. Oh, and here's something you can research. Find a link between AI talking to other AI. And this is just my own hypothesis here, but yeah, yeah. And you hear other people kind of alluding to it. There's two different things. And I think the one is leading to the other where there's, we're generating, um, uh, we're generating, uh, this is automated journalism. I should put a little note right there. Uh, generate pre-trading transformer uh, right there. I'll take that here. Let's see, I edit that. Uh, quick here, bear with me. Uh, automated journalism. Uh, this is automated journalism. I guess I could have typed it in as fast as copying and pasting it out of here, but you know, oops, now I really could have. Wait a second, if I can't grab a hold of this nicely. Come on, get a hold of it. All right, that's annoying. All right, well, I'll fix that later. This is automated journalism here, and this is how, in my own theory, and this one guy you hear, famous guy on TV, also big mutual fund manager, and a serious guy, I mean, top of this class at Harvard and business and everything, but uh, Jim Cramer talking about how the machines are doing some automated uh, buying and selling and that they're reading some of the headlines that are being generated after the close of the markets where there's not people involved anymore. And so it's like the AI of the stock picking reading the AI generated automated headlines that aren't generated by people often either. So this is, Watch this first. So you can do a research project about this. <clears throat> Find more cases of this AI talking to AI, causing problems, misrepresenting what humans would otherwise do, maybe, in your opinion. Loads. Uh, machine. Artificial intelligence that actually sounds intelligent. GPT-3, or the third generation generative pre-trained transformer, is a neural network machine learning model developed by OpenAI, trained to generate any type of human language text. As of early 2021, GPT-3 is the largest neural network ever produced with over 175 billion machine learning parameters. We'll give an introduction on how GPT-3 works 
But to dive deeper into its text generation and impact on businesses, click the link above or in the description below. Typically, AI and natural language processing machines struggle to generate natural human language text, given the complexities and nuances of language. But GPT-3 is unique in that it's specifically trained to generate realistic human text. It's been used to create articles, poetry, news reports, and dialogue, and is used for automated conversational tasks, like customer service chatbots. So how does it work? GPT-3 models are trained on a vast body of internet text to spot patterns in speech and language. Then a user inputs text, even as little as a few sentences, the trained system analyzes the language and uses a text predictor to create the most likely output that even without much additional tuning or training is high quality and feels similar to what humans would say or write. For example, a GPT-3 question and answer model would not only provide factual answers, but also use common sense. Meaning if you were to ask or input, how many legs does a dog have? It could answer, a dog has four legs. But an open-ended question like, why would a dog be someone's favorite animal could yield an equally accurate common sense reply like, because dogs are friendly and loyal. It's not limited to just question and answer formats, though. For instance, copy.ai is a website that takes a short, user-written product description and generates original, usable marketing copy. GPT-3 can also be used to create content in the style of anyone. It could generate a poem in the style of Shakespeare, give advice from Aristotle, simulate a conversation with Elon Musk, and much more. Fun or for business. GPT-3 is a great solution for when large amounts of text need to be generated from a machine based on a small amount of input, but it has several shortcomings and risks, including limited learning, as GPT-3 models are pre-trained and do not keep learning, inability to explain and interpret outputs, small input size, which can limit some applications, and a wide range of machine learning bias exhibiting the same human biases found in online text it was trained on. What are some other applications of GPT-3? Have you used it in your business? Share your thoughts in the comments and be sure to hit that like button too. Okay, and be sure to share your three. Are, uh, what are some uh, other applications to machine learning um pre-trained so it's not an adaptive learning machine you are limited to the training set that was trained with and then you know new ideas new people people might get lazy and not update the thing so you're left with whatever it was trained with and you may not know how that data set really impacted the interconnections you can't trace neural network uh, learning, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, with millions, up to millions of neurons now, but even thousands of neurons, the connections are updated one at a time uh, for each data and desired output kind of uh, training set of, uh, you know, uh, millions of pieces of data now. And that data is collected, for example, by humans uh, or uh, human behavior patterns. And, uh, and and it just learns and it's gonna act sort of like that data set of whoever that data came from. Um, inability to explain and interpret the outputs in the neural network doesn't know how it came up with all that. It's just looking at all the data and, and finding some uh, collective compromise between all the stimulus and, and resulting output of all everything in the data set. Uh, small input size, so the data set could be limiting and depending on your application, and a wide range of biases. And this is key too, because if you're, you know, that everybody has certain biases and, and even prejudices. And if you're not careful, the data set can incorporate that. And you may not be able to trace that, unravel it, or even see it. And it could be impacting uh, the stories. In this case, that they're selling you know, the idea of writing stories. This particular kind of thing actually. Uh, this kind of software just resulted in 27 people at Microsoft being uh, laid off permanently. 
that were writers because they were replaced with software that writes articles. Uh, and so you, you decide yourself if that's a thing you want happening. Uh, I mean, I could, in some cases I could see maybe, but uh, still, okay. Um, it's all over now. This is not brand new either. Uh, this is just a 2021. This is you know, just happened advertisement for it, but it's been around for about five, six years now. I've seen this happening. And then here's something that just happened a couple of days ago on the markets and uh, how I'll let you listen to it. Why doesn't every home in the U.S. have solar panels? The number one reason is not about sunlight, weather, or even politics. Let's get down to the New York Stock Exchange. Jim Cramer joins us now. We're positive, uh, uh, Jim. I, I guess that was such a good GDP number. We should welcome that. But it does uh, shed or at, at least put uh, the Fed moves and fiscal moves. Uh, we, we need to shine a light on these things, on how hot we really want it to get, maybe. Yeah, we're, we're in that good news is bad news period. And uh, Dick Fisher says some unbelievable, he's so thoughtful. He was saying that Fed doesn't have a lot of room if it overshoots. And yeah, you know, so this is one of those moments that what happens is that these machines come on and when it, machines I mean algorithms and they just blitz any buyers. So I'm urging people to not pay up. Uh, you'll probably get a better price because there's some people and machines that just say you have to sell because of what the Fed's doing. Uh, it's really a shame because they're not distinguishing can be good and bad, Joe. You know that. They're just selling everything. Do you uh, – I know you listen to Pal ta uh, Chairman Powell take him at his, sure. at his word, but he's, he's human. Do you, do you think there could be a lot of pressure come to bear if, if, if they – I mean, we have big gains in the market over the year, but you know how it gets with just a, a couple of – like if it was 10, 15, 20 percent – do you think they still follow through or do they, they use the wealth uh, effect excuse to say, you know, we're going to pause in, in, on the hiking? Did, well, is, the put, they, is the put really dead, Jim? You, you yeah, the put's it. dead. The put's put's dead. dead. Or way I mean, out of the money. They, or way out of the money. Yeah, I mean, I think he's really tired of uh, I mean, any, anything that is excess and what's excess in our market. Obviously, the IPOs and we know the SPACs. Uh, the Kathy Wood stocks, these are all excessive and they do poorly in this environment going forward, as Jonathan Gray did. I mean, Jonathan told a very good, really smart person, as rates go higher and then we pay, have lower PEs that we like. And you have to be able to have a buyback. You have to have a dividend boost. Who's doing that? Well, mostly the oil companies. So, I mean, we, we got in this situation where uh, you have a Stan Druckenmiller market. People just come in and they say, listen, I've had it. And then so we have, do we revert to 2018? Uh, in October to 2018 to December? I think no. I think what you just said is true, which is that Powell looks and sees if there's a lot of damage he lay, lays back. But uh, the tenor of the market is very angry. So anytime you see the futures up, you know that there's sellers. Like last night, Don Chu was talking this morning on the five. It was really great. He's talking about how much the market was down at 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. Joe, we know this is ridiculous. 1 a.m. I mean, what are people so desperate to sell at 1 a.m.? What do they know? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> Right. Uh, you've seen but that. But you've had great guests this morning. Great yeah. guests. And the guests okay. are really saying, be careful. Yeah. Back. Hey, hey, Jim, how much of that is options activity, too? How, how much of this gets exaggerated because there's so much of that's happening on puts and calls? Well, I, I think what's happening is you've got a lot of people who do options, a lot of people do ETFs, and there's not enough time uh, to have bids built. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are trying to buy something well uh, above where the sellers are willing to sell because they're automatic. And so you have this kind of weird imbalance. We used to actually see it more. There'd be someone, let's say, bidding 34 for a stock, but the machines are willing to sell it at 31. So they cut right through 34. Th and there's no bid underneath 33, 32. Next thing you know, the stock's 31, and, and no one's down there to be able to buy it because it happens so quickly. The sell programs are overrunning the buy. We've seen this happen a couple of times in our careers. And it doesn't uh, mean that stocks are bad. It just means you should be a little bit more uh, prudent and don't bid so close and don't pay attention to what the future is doing. Pay attention to what you like.
And they're going to get you a great price for what you like. American Express at 169 the other day. Thank you very much. You know, we have a lot of stocks that literally you can get them for far lower than they should because the machines are obliterating. Read my eyes. They tell my story. And the story of Voluminous Original, America's number one mascara. Creamy formula for five times the volume. Voluminous Original Mascara by L'Oreal. My eyes are saying you're worth it. Oh, that was it. Okay. Um, well, there's a little bit more on that. But that, that gets... But I think what really just, matters is... Oops, let me turn it off. Uh, so hopefully you see what's going on there. Um, Let's get down to the New York Stock Exchange, Jim Cray. That and go back in, <coughs> in here. Um, here, no, we're going to close that video too. Go back in here. Let's go back just on the syllabus. Actually, better yet, to go in the frame here. Go back in here. Oops, there it was. Um, back in here. So, we're talking about the computers generating press first in that first video, headlines automatically. And then the second video is about the machines, the computers and AI, the algorithms doing automated trading. That's not really representative of what the humans would do, but they get some certain momentum and a sell off. Um, now there's a bunch of different terms there and I'm gonna explain some of them. Uh, when he's talking about IPOs, that's an initial price offering of a company that just goes public. Uh, these SPACs, these special purpose acquisition groups that uh, throw money into those kind of uh, sometimes not best investment startup kind of things. Um, this is a little bigger here. Uh, PE ratios were already mentioned. You heard him talking about electronic trades, electronic transfers, the automated trading that goes on due to algorithms and AI. So, um, okay, let's slow down here for a second and take a look at uh, the different, now there's, there's different um, places that stocks are traded all over the world. There's you know, different countries that have their own markets, but the US markets arguably drive quite a bit of the world. So um, in case you didn't know, we're, the United States is about 5% of the population of the earth, only 5%, but we control about 25% of the economics, you know, our GDP and everything that we do. And our military is essentially unmatched too, but that's a whole other thing. But um, so, you know, we have some big influence and our markets are a big influence. And, and most of you will work for companies that uh, if work for any public company, it's gonna be traded on a US exchange of some kind. The first is the Dow Jones, the Dow. And that's just 30 big companies. I'll show you those. And it's not really high tech, but it's the biggest, the average because of 30 of the largest and most widely held public uh, companies. And this is just since May of 2002, so the past 23, 22 years, and a nice upward growth here. That's, that's a nice investment on your money. So I didn't start investing until the mid 1990s. And uh, you know I'm going the long haul because it's for retirement. I'm not a day trader, speculator. So ride out these peaks and valleys that will happen. Here are those companies. Oh, and so up all above here, the yellow stuff is stuff I want you to memorize. Down here where it's green, do not memorize all this, but this is important perhaps to you because these are the big companies that have high tech jobs and all of you in this class are high tech of some kind. <clears throat> um, Apple, you all know Apple. Boeing, you may not know of Boeing that well, but they uh, huge builder of aircrafts, uh, also military contractors. We have a former president of Boeing uh, at the college, uh, US ambassador, John Craig. Uh, and you actually will listen to a guest lecture by him recorded as part of this class. Um, 
uh, because of COVID, I'm not asking him to uh, come and give a talk right now. And he's, he's getting close to 80 years old too, so I don't wanna tax him too much. Uh, although he's not slowing down, he has an office in Washington, DC and an office in the United Arab Emirates where he flies every three weeks to run a venture capital company there. Uh, and he's part of a big uh, global initiative in Washington, DC too, but uh, still. Cisco, um, General Electric, IBM, Intel. Uh, I could tell you a whole story about any one of these companies, but for now, uh, let's just say that these are probably places you might want to send your resume to, uh, just to their human resources department. You're not going to get it to a person. It's going to get scanned in. Uh, it's going to look for keywords for matching. So forget the whole one-page resume thing. If you're sending to a big company, I don't. I mean, I know people tell you otherwise, but uh, if they're scanning in your resume and the database is looking for matches to keywords, pack in as many words as you can that look like something that they might, you know, certainly every skill you have, I put the name of every course you've had, uh, every, certainly every language, every device, uh, because it might just hit on one of these search engines. Now, eventually it'll get to a person and if it looks like a giant block of text where you did that on purpose, you're going to annoy somebody in human resources, but to get through the first screening of these huge companies, because these are all, you know, 100, 200, 300,000 people companies. And yes, IBM is on the Dow, you know, and Intel, right? Apple. Uh, and there, are high, there are high tech people that work in these other companies, and I could tell you all about DuPont Company. Uh, and, uh, I've known several people that worked in there in high tech, but the abundance of jobs proportionately uh, yeah, on this list are the ones I've highlighted. Then the NASDAQ. So if you're in high tech, you, and this is yellow again, you want to memorize the, the NASDAQ's over 3,000 co company components. Um, it's where the tech, the tech mostly is living. Uh, so it just got hammered, but you know this is a, this is over twenty years here, so it got hammered just right here. So you know, hammered in a relative context, and it's back up again. It got oversold, but you know the trajectory is going to, in most everybody's opinion, keep going up. Maybe not as drastically sharp as this curve here, but it's never gone down for a sustained period of time, you know, decades, decade. So here are a whole bunch of companies and I've drilled down in a bunch of these. I know most of these just from experience. Um, I actually worked with a number of them in different capacities and at least, could tell you that there's definitely some tech, lots of tech in the NASDAQ 100. Blizzard, that's a big gaming thing that uh, I've got friends in out in California. Adobe, you know what they do. Uh, Google is actually Alphabet Inc. There's, there's two different classes of that. Amazon, <coughs> of course you know what that is. <coughs> Apple Autodesk makes the 3D rendering software that you maybe hear me talk about in other classes and architecture things. Big company, they dominate that worldwide. Broadcom, Cadence, this is what we actually design. Hardware descriptive language, uh, VLSI circuit design, IBM, we used Cadence. Uh, we still made our own circuits down deep inside and simulated things, but uh, for the scaling up, we use Cadence on prescriptive language. Uh, some of these a little more obscure, you'd have to drill down into um, to find out more about. But you know, just looking through those, you know, Facebook certainly. Facebook just got hammered. We're gonna look at that in a second. Uh, and some of these companies are listed in both the, the Dow and the Nasdaq, so it's not like exclusively you're on one exchange or the other. Um, and so there's a bunch of stuff in here. Nvidia, you all know what they do, graphics cards. PayPal, of course, Seagate. Don't care about much that, that much anymore, but they were exclusively all uh, hard drives for years. And of course, Tesla and Elon Musk, you know. Other things on there. Xilinx. 
software we used for the FPGAs for years until the integrated development environment went out of style, out of support. S&P 500. So this is kind of like the Dow. It's it's a mix of things. It's and and the Nasdaq. It's not just high tech. It's not just the top 30, but it's it's more like a nice cross section of everybody, big and small, tech or not. And so a lot of people like to look at that more. <laughs> but, you know, that's going up uh, in our stock exchange composite. And there's other things too, real estate investment trusts, things you can look at. Um, and then now here, I put the, no, I'm pregnant. So now um, here are a couple picks here. So, you know, I'm a former IBMer. So I just grabbed this sheet here. And uh, this is what you maybe want to do. I mean, you don't have to use CNBC or Yahoo Finance or you use whatever you want, but I want you to pick a company for your next homework that you not only want to invest in, but also work at. So uh, think carefully of who you pick because if you pick some place and it's a crappy place to work, you just think it's going to go up. Uh, I mean, that's not the idea in the assignment. I mean, for investing, maybe you could do that. Uh, so now this is IBM and uh, they have a 5% per year yield. So that means it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But if you never sell it, just hold it for a long time, it's paying you five, you know, like 5% 5 a year. You're gonna, that's much more than you're going to get out of a bank account or a certificate of deposit or any kind of treasury bill or anything that's just a fixed rate. Um, and so if you have a stock that's stable like that over time, uh, you know, you want to hold it just like you would for your less risky ventures and a very healthy price to earnings ratio of around 20. Um, so but actually that's higher than when I was inside IBM. We always like 12 to 18 people would say was good. Um, but, you know, and nowadays market 20 is good, healthy compared to other <coughs> stocks. Now, I'm not going to tell you what indicators to look at here and figuring out the market cap and all that. That's essentially the number of stocks times the value of each stock and the dividend yield. Uh, that's, this is a dividend that's actually paid per stock. So you have to look at the stock value, but as a percentage, the yield. Uh, and so, you know, it's about 5%. Uh, the price to earnings ratio, the forward projection is like just predicting future earnings. But you know, right now, the price to earnings ratio is about 20. Uh, and there's other indicators here. And then, you know, if you want to just look at the analysts, most people hold, you know, this is a long time hold thing. It's not speculative stock. It's not going to go up drastically, but it's going to be secure over a long period of time. Here's Apple. Uh, oh, and this is, you know, the close of the market the day before I took this snapshot. And this is after, hour, after hours trading. And some of them only trade for a little bit. Uh, it's because if they go on these other markets, I mean, they're listed also on other exchanges. Um, and, you know, the other places in the world are still buying and selling for the most part, even though most things happen in the United States here. Um, the trading that affects any of these things that most of you would invest in. And so this is a strong buy now. So there was, we just had a, a, you know, a, a semi, a pretty big correction in the, in the tech stocks. And so uh, everybody's saying, yeah, buy, buy, buy. Uh, price to earnings is not out of hand here. 28 is, is good. Still, it's not, you know, as good as IBM's, but it's still very good. Uh, Microsoft, which is software. Now, the price to earnings ratio for software is typically higher than companies that do hardware and software like Apple and uh, IBM. So, you, you know, it's understood that typically the software companies have higher PE ratios. Um, that's Microsoft. Again, oversold most recently because this blip here. So everybody's saying buy. Although even when it's not a blip like that, there's still most people are. This is you know good future. Google. Uh, Google's doing doing good, very good. Um, <clears throat> And 
and you, and you can see how it performs like industry average here all these show you how they're outperforming the industry average so you can look at that too you can see all these every one of these stocks that i show you here industry average and uh, you know over certain periods of time always almost always better so you can't really go wrong with these terribly uh, and COVID helped because tech was up during COVID. Everybody needed technology. So, okay. One more thing down here before I stop talking about financial things. Uh, beware of too many tech IPOs, initial price offerings. Um, I, the first, I, the first time listing the stock by a company when it goes public, especially during times when there's a proliferation of these special purpose acquisition companies making money available for sometimes not so stable ventures, et cetera. Uh, make sure these companies are actually making a product or providing a clearly valuable service and they are earning money. Watch their PE ratios. Otherwise, you know, you just get an influx of venture capital kind of money just backing up some idea when the market's hot and then the company's not really making anything, but people are just buying into the hype and then uh, finally here, I have no comment on cryptocurrency other than consider the risks and what is actually backing their value. So, you know, if you have some currency that if somebody just tweets something wrong, the thing goes nuts. And I think, you know, maybe who I'm talking about, um, you, you got to be careful. And, and you know, some of the history of this stuff comes out of uh, very illicit trading of uh, even illegal things. And so... Um, you want to read up about that. There's a legal risk versus risk or opportunity talking about that. And Forbes is a good business magazine. My father got that for his whole life, really, and I'd read copies of that. And then Invest, Investopedio, uh, oh, this is a legal, the legal risk, actually, in the second one here. And Forbes is a good general overview, including some legal risk. So, yeah, I mean, maybe you want to put a little bit in the risk. So my portfolio is pretty spread out. I mean, it's private. I don't tell you everything, but I, I mean, I've got a lot of different things in a lot of different places, and uh, some is more risky than others, but nothing quite this risky. Um, but you know, if you're young and you want to take a chance with a quarter of your savings, you have plenty of time to recover. But I don't recommend gambling all of your money. Put it in some known things, and don't be too when you're young. Don't be too uh, too afraid of some risk. I mean, stocks are risky in themselves compared to some guaranteed uh, yield kind of things. I mean, you know, just a bank account or uh, you know, a bond or certificate or a treasury bill or something like that. Okay, um, so let's do this now. So uh, I'm going to stop recording here because that's kind of what I think the gist of this is here. Uh, da, 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 pause. Okay. Um, I'll just stop the video. I think that's enough. We're not recording now, let's just pause. Oh, no, hold on a second here. Resume, share. I'm just gonna stop sharing, I think. All right, hopefully I think, no. Oh.